Portraiting in ISTDP, common mistakes and their solutions, and some psychodiagnostic considerations. Portraiting refers to encouraging, some would say pressuring, a psychotherapy client to create a mental portrait of their affect-laden impulses. By impulse, we mean the urge to act. Each emotion has an accompanying urge to act, whether it's anger with its concomitant urge to punish, love with its urge to be tender, or genuine guilt with the urge to repair and set things right. The technique of portraiting can be used in different contexts and serve different functions. Perhaps the most common usage of this technique is with highly resistant patients who defend strongly and vigorously against their feelings and against allowing the therapist close to them and in the context of unremitting pressure and challenge, with a high level of rise and mobilization of the complex transference feelings, as the resistance begins to give way and the feelings break through, the therapist might say, and if this rage came pouring out of you onto me, what would you want to do with it in your fantasy? When this goes well, the impulse arises spontaneously from the client's depth, from their unconscious, and is experienced by the client visually, though other sensory experiences are often included as well, including sounds and even taste. The client then describes or paints a picture or portrait to the therapist that contains the first-person perspective of the motoric and sensory details involved in the visualization of the impulses and their graphic consequences. This is primarily a visual situation that amounts to a frame-by-frame dream-like experience. When a client is engaged in this, they're working through the emotionally charged material. Often after aggressive impulses have been worked through, tenderness, guilt, and grief-laden impulses also break through, though the sequence can actually vary. The technique of portraiting plays a big role in unearthing all the psychic and affect-laden material. The other usage and function of the technique of portraiting takes place with clients with lower ego-adaptive capacity using, say, instant repression and self-attack, and also those with some fragility in their psychic structure that need to increase their capacity to tolerate anxiety and intense feelings. But keep in mind, with severely fragile people, we do not use this technique. With clients like this, we sometimes portrait impulses at a lower level of rise and mobilization of the complex transference feelings, not aiming for an unlocking of the unconscious, but aiming for restructuring defenses, building capacity, and strengthening both the conscious and unconscious therapeutic alliance. Though this way of working can easily inspire the client to produce conscious fantasies rather than gain access to previously unconscious impulses, the hope is that the latter occurs more than the former. And even in cases where conscious fantasy is produced, however, it seems to sometimes still serve the overall positive purpose of loosening the psychic system, building capacity, and increasing the client's understanding of the therapeutic task. A side note about this class of clients. Though you can think of those with only higher ego-adaptive capacity as having the ability to truly resist emotional closeness in a vigorous manner, those with fragility can still be and often are highly avoidant of emotional closeness. This is a finer point about how clients avoid intimacy with themselves and others related to the nature of the avoidance itself. 
don't fall into the trap of thinking that fragile people are somehow less avoidant just because they may not have the ego strength to make use of a certain class of defenses. Keep in mind Davenu's explanation. The more intense the feelings and impulses, the greater the need to defend against them, and therefore the intensity of the defenses are commensurate with the intensity of the avoided affective material. We know that the further right we go on the neurotic spectrum and into the fragile spectrum, we see first an absence of rage, then eventually rage and homicidal rage, then torturous rage, the further rightward we go, and we see an impoverished and eventually fragile ego, but a mighty superego function that keeps the ego in its clutches, if you will. This should make it clear that even though fragile clients aren't able to use higher order defenses, such as isolation of affect, they manage to avoid intimacy with themselves and others in different ways that preclude closeness just as much as a sturdy wall comprised of intellectual defenses. If you feel strongly about reserving the term resistance for isolation of affect, just use the term avoidance of emotional closeness when it comes to the way fragile clients avoid experiencing their innermost thoughts and feelings and allowing you close to them. The key thing to understand is that if there was no distance at all between the client her inner life, and you, the client would have no need for therapy. The issue is about what kind of distancing the client is engaged in. Never think that you cannot refer to regressive or primitive defenses as forms of distancing. They certainly are. Common problems when trying a portrait. In high resistance cases, where a standard format of ISTDP is used, with unremitting pressure and challenge, a common mistake is to invite the client to portrait their feelings prematurely, meaning that the rise of complex transference feelings could reach a higher altitude and the resistance can have been neutralized to a greater degree. When this happens, we often get some feelings, sometimes a partial unlocking of the unconscious, but we likely miss out on a major unlocking of the unconscious. This protracts the treatment. The remedy is to keep the pressure on the resistance, and if there's sufficient affect online, pressure on the experience of this affect for longer periods, and not inviting any portraiting until the client is highly, highly charged and the interpsychic crisis is reached, tipping over in favor of the unconscious alliance over the resistance. Clues that this is occurring often involves the client's body language, giving away the experience of the impulse, and the client herself volunteering their feelings in a forceful manner. Often the client makes a fist or a gesture of strangulation. In those clients where we're using portraiting to build greater affect tolerance capacity, a very common problem is to not recognize when the client is forcing the portrait while remaining detached and going through the motions. It's critical to notice when clients are going through the motions of having feelings while actually remaining a step or two removed from any real feeling. In a situation like this, the patient is often behind a barrier of compliance trying to be a good patient while acting as if they're working through their feelings. This amounts to the appearance of having feelings while actually forming yet another layer of resistance or avoidance of emotional closeness. If the therapist does not notice this but goes along with the lackluster exercise of portraiting, a major misalliance occurs in that the therapist now becomes one more figure in the client's life who does not see what is really going on for the client. Further pressure of any kind while the patient feels and is unseen is a therapeutic disaster. 
The remedy. Take a step back and assess what is creating the problem. It can be a number of factors. Here are some common ones. The foundational work related to forming a conscious therapeutic alliance might need more work. The client may not really see the connection between their symptoms and what they do to avoid feelings. If this is the case, work on this first. Or it could be a malignant resistance, avoidance, coming in to defeat the process. More defense work might be needed. Perhaps a defensive area that remains egocentric is being approached. Or projective processes might be in operation. In which case, you certainly do not want to invite portraiting, but address the projections first and foremost. Encouraging portraiting when a client uses projections reinforces the projections and the splitting that enables the projective process. Whatever the issue is, sort it out and address it first and foremost. Let's have a look at a few examples that contain a bit more specificity to better learn about problematic instances of portraiting and how to avoid these mistakes. Assuming the problem is not connected to the client not seeing the connection between avoidance and their symptoms, but instead more of an issue of the need for distancing and self-defeat, as soon as you notice that your client is engaged in a lackluster portrait, while in actuality detached and not truly engaged or involved, you want to say things like, you're still distant, trying to access your feelings while you're still actually detached or behind a wall. Assuming the issue is that the client is not fully aware of their defense, the defense is egocentric, point out the defense and then explain. Trying to get in touch with feelings while you're distant, compliant, detached, name whatever the major column of defense happens to be, is not going to work. We obviously cannot get to your feelings when you're hanging on to this defense. So the first order of business is, what are you going to do about this avoidance, if anything? As long as you stay distant in this manner, this process isn't going to get you anywhere. Given that we're focused now on clients with lower ego adaptive capacity in need of capacity building, our tone should typically be mild, matter of fact, and free from any added pressure and challenge other than what's already contained in the intervention itself. The main principle is to turn the client against the defense and mobilize a stronger or higher rise in feelings before inviting a portrait, while at the same time not going above capacity threshold. But the process of doing so can vary a great deal and look very different depending on a host of factors. It is important to understand that clients on the fragile spectrums are often not ready for any kind of portraiting work for some time. It's often a good idea, actually, to take this intervention completely off the table for a long time with fragile clients. Portraiting to build capacity and to shore up the conscious alliance often works best with repressive, self-attacking clients that are not overly resistant. It cannot be stated enough. When clients are neck deep in splitting and projective processes, portraiting should be off the table. Remember, a number of different client presentations warrant forms of pressure that do not involve applying traditional active forms of pressure, such as repeatedly asking what feelings the client has or pressuring the client to do something about their defensive stance. The strength of the conscious alliance should also be a major determining factor in the degree and kind of pressure that we make use of. With passive or combative clients, for example, the more active form of pressure can backfire and the client may need you to back off and become silent or some other creative intervention to help the client fully see and turn against whatever it is they're doing to impede their own progress. Keep in mind that there are multiple ways of applying therapeutic pressure. This is especially important to keep in mind when projective processes may be part of the equation. When projections or projective anxiety is the culprit, 
always prioritize restructuring this so that the client is in relationship with you and not their projections. When the client has access to self-attacking defenses, we need to go out of our way to not appear critical or scolding, as this would merely pile on. As I've mentioned briefly a few times, portraiting is not appropriate when the client is in any kind of heavy projection, uh, as this merely reinforces splitting and the projections. Here, when this is occurring, the target of feelings will be one-dimensional, either idealized or without any redeeming qualities, and the attempts at processing the feelings and impulses will remain unproductive and they'll contain a grinding, unpleasant, if not even agonizing quality. No emotional relief is forthcoming. And here we are at the end of this video presentation. This was by no means an exhaustive list of common problems and solutions pertaining to portraiting, but I hope that this gave you a few helpful ideas. Thank you for watching.